Welcome, Persisters and Brothers, to another episode of Persistence You with Lisbeth. Today, I'm honored to have John Giordano, who is an author and an expert in all things substance abuse. John has a very interesting story, and in a second, he's going to read a little bit from his book, one of his books that he's uh, written. But before that, I just want to say, of course, this show is never giving medical advice. I'm never going to tell you this. There is one way to healing, whether it's from substance abuse or anything, but to keep your mind open to some really interesting and scientifically proven ways to address trauma, to address substance abuse, things like that. I'm always all for hearing about it. I just mentioned a couple of weeks ago, I got back from a writer's conference. One of my favorite workshops was on um, the use of ketamine and ketamine in dealing with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was something I had never heard. And I worked in the field for many, many years. There's so much to constantly be learning. And that's something I appreciate about Mr. George. Giordano today is that he's going to share with us his journey, how he's helping so many other people deal with substance abuse and can constantly evolving the interventions and what we think is normal sort of treatment. We can learn a lot from him. So let's get started. Thanks so much for being here. My pleasure. I would surely love for you to read your passage that just okay. introduces you to us. All righty. Well, let me just give a little quick thing. Uh, everything I do is evidence-based. Yes. And it's precision medicine. I'm in, I work with scientists and researchers and clinicians from 15 universities. I'm currently in 79 medical and scientific peer review journals. And I've been working with mental health and addiction for over 35 years. So I wrote this book to help motivate people to show them no matter what happens in life, they can be successful. So I'll read a little, a little quick passage from it. The name of the book is The Kid from the South Bronx Who Never Gave Up. Here is my roadmap for positive change. There is one thing in this world, one special lesson, one constant that has guided me through the turbulent waters of life. This infinite rule, which most people know but ignore, who simply do not follow their life lessons. That is, no matter what, no matter the circumstances, the obstacles, the people that get in our way, or things that slow us down, follow this one simple rule. Never give up on your dreams, never let go of your passions, and especially never give up on yourself or a God of your understanding. My name is John Giordano. I'm a recovering addict who turned $300 into 45 million. I was blessed to become extremely successful and I'd like to share my story with you. This is how my life was transformed and how I was saved from falling into the abyss of hell and by following this one rule and learning how to have a life worth living. I always like to read that to people to show them because my life story, I um, actually only went to the ninth grade. I have a GED and then I went back to school after I got into recovery. And of course, I got all my degrees and all the things that I do. Um, and uh, my family was a mafia family. I have molested when I was eight and a half. My father went to jail when I was eight. He was a heroin dealer. Uh, my uncle was a hitman. Uh, my whole family was a mafia type family. Matter of fact, my uncle threw the, my wedding when I was 20 and the caterer insulted him. So he killed him the next day. Hmm. So we had to go leave town. So, you know, I, I was in gangs when I was a kid. I said, I'll never be like my family. I wanted to be just like them. I never got arrested. I don't even have a misdemeanor, fortunately enough. Um, I was um, dealing drugs, doing drugs. I went, my family did an intervention on me eventually. Uh, I'm also a grandmaster in the martial arts, a black belt hall of fame, national karate champion, all that kind of stuff also. And um, I wound up doing a lot of things with my life, even before recovery, just to show you that uh, the light that's inside each one of us can shine regardless of the darkness around us. And um, I got the Martin Luther King Award 
for revitalizing Liberty City and all the town is the black community. It was right after the riots. So I did a lot of things during my life that led me up to where I am today. And um, I went to treatment. I wanted to become a counselor. That's what I did. Eventually, I opened up a treatment center and with my doctor and my therapist. And that didn't work out too well. It's in the book, so you can read about that. And as life went forward, I opened up another treatment center and I got involved with a corporate raider, which I didn't know that was what even that was. And after a year, he stole the treatment center out from under me, but I kept going. Then I was a clinical director for a 55 bed indigent facility that was for housing people with HIV, dual diagnosed clients. That means they have a mental condition and also substance abuse. And it was an OTC, meaning they used to put people in the middle of the room and then they used to break them down and then try to build them back up, which it was ridiculous. I, I knew nobody knew how to beat me up. I did a good enough job on my own. So eventually I opened up my treatment center and um, I wanted to do something different. My son almost died from this disease. I almost did, so did my wife. So I got into science and research on who's gonna to listen to a kid from the South Bronx. Mm -hmm. And um, I was fortunate enough um, to get involved with Dr. Mash, who did Ibogaine, who was a pioneer in Ibogaine. Ibogaine is a bush from West Africa that the weedy tribe used as a rite of passage but also a heroin addict who wanted to get high, a different kind of high, went to West Africa and used Ibogaine. Well, what, after he woke up the next morning, he was detoxed, which is unheard of, because usually it takes anywhere from seven to nine days to detox off of opiates, mm -hmm. opioids. And also he felt like he had no more cravings. So he figured out he could make money with this and opened up a clinic in Panama. And that's how Dr. Mash got involved with him. All right. But then she no longer went with him and opened up a clinic in St. Kitts because Ibogaine is considered a schedule one drug, meaning that it has addictive properties, which is not true at all, by the way. And um, so we opened it up in St. Kitts where that was allowed. And I worked with her for about 13 years. Well, I still work with her for 20 years, by the way, over 20 years. Uh, she's currently in England doing what they call the FDA trials and bringing over here to the United States. Since now the United States is being open to psychedelics. And SSRIs, um, Prozac, Zoloft, Wellbutrin, all these different things that they give people doesn't really work very well, unfortunately. And if you look at the science, it was only meant for short-term intervention. But as soon as the pharmaceutical companies decided, well, we can use it for long term and make some money from it, and that's what happened. Now, anything I talk about is science based, so it's not my opinion only. So the bottom line is there's a lot of suicides in the VA because I work with our vets. I also do trauma work with police officers that have been in shooting and people coming back, uh, vets coming back from Iraq, Afghanistan. And uh, a lot of the, the SSRIs. They're having multiple problems. It's all over now. They're, they're investigating it. Some of these people are on four, five, six, seven, eight meds, which is absolutely ridiculous. Um, and so psychedelics, they're looking for a new way how to treat depression and anxiety. Now, one of the things I lecture about, matter of fact, all over the world, um, I lectured in Taipei at the Neuroscience Conference, the neuroscientists. I lectured in Budapest, Chicago, Baltimore, uh, everywhere. I lectured about over 100 countries already. See, what we're not looking at when it comes to mental health issues like depression and anxiety, most people don't realize that 70 to 90% of dopamine and serotonin, that's your feel-good drugs that we manufacture naturally, is found in your gut, your microbiome or microbiota. That's the flora in your gut. So when you look at that, it goes up to the vagus nerve and it deposits it into the brain. I'm also, a, also fortunate enough to be on a science team with Dr. Kenneth Blum. He's the geneticist who found the addiction gene. 
there is a main gene for addiction. It's called the DRD2 ALE1 variant gene. Now, of course, there's a whole other bunch of genes, but this is the main gene for addiction. Mm -hmm. Now, we look at addiction, we call it, Dr. Blum calls it RDS, Reward Deficiency Syndrome. What that means is addiction is not just about drugs and alcohol, it's also about behaviors. You got sex addiction, gambling addiction, you got work addiction. So people always ask me, well, how do you know someone's an addict? So I ask them a simple question. If you continue to use a substance or a behavior in spite of adverse consequences, maybe you need to look at that. It makes it real simple. Yep, absolutely. Okay, so most people don't understand that depression is caused by other medical conditions, not just psychological. And most people don't even know that. And most scientists didn't even put the connections together. Because after my lectures, they all come around me. We never thought of this, we never thought of that. There's such a thing as leaky gut syndrome, H. pylori infection. Look it up, guys. I, I don't ask anybody to believe a word I tell you. Causes depression and anxiety. Low testosterone, high testosterone can cause depression and anxiety. Hypoglycemia can cause depression and anxiety. Especially the women understand this, a low thyroid can cause depression and anxiety. So can a closed head injury, depression, anxiety, suicidal ideation, and behavioral problems. Look at our football players. So there are a multitude of medical conditions that we as clinicians and as medical people in the mental health field are not looking at. People come in, we ask them a bunch of questions. Oh, okay, take this pill and let's see what happens. So there's a lot of co-contributing factors to mental health issues. So I've been on the search for things that help and I've come across a number of things. First of all, you need to treat your gut. The gut is called, now they call it a second brain. I've been talking about it for 20 years. Probiotics, prebiotics, and enzymes, number one. Number two, stay away from processed food and sugars. Do the best you can. Nobody's perfect. Okay, I understand that. Exercise. Exercise depletes stress. Stress depletes dopamine. Exercise increases dopamine and serotonin. So that's very important that you exercise, have that in your regime. Okay, if you can't afford to go to a gym, walk, run, ride a bike, borrow a bike if you don't have a bike, okay? Something to cause your body to start moving. We're meant to move, not sit around sedentary all day long. Be careful of the words you use because thoughts that you have create chemical changes in your brain. Those chemical changes cause emotional states. So you have to be very conscious of your verbiage that comes out of your mouth. Instead of saying, I'm gonna to try to do this. I think I could do that. What you're already telling me is you're not sure of anything. There's no commitment there. Commitment and consistency is very, very important if you wanna be successful in life. And you don't give up. And there are, see, when people go, well, I failed at this, I failed. There are no failures in life. There are only lessons. Now, it's what you gleam out of those lessons is how you go to the next one. And that's just what I learned. Oh, I'm still learning in life. So I came across some other things like ketamine. I was against ketamine because it was a special... It was a, a, a club drug called Special K. I says, well, look, I did enough psychedelics when I was using, okay? I know all about that stuff. This was years ago. And then Kenemy came across and says, well, then I read the science where it grows new neurons in the brain where depression and anxiety come from, okay? And you're rewiring yourself. Now, Ketamine alone is not the answer. I'm just going to let you know that clearly. You need 
coaching integration, which are ketamine journey, to extrapolate out what you learn from your subconscious, because it goes into your subconscious. Talk therapy goes into your frontal lobes. It's the software of the brain, I call it. Psychedelics treat a hard, hard drive. As you know, if you erase something on your computer, it's still on your hard drive. So it's the same thing with your emotional states, your traumas in life, and things of that nature. I also do at our clinic, I do the PTSD work. I'm an EMDR specialist. It's called Eye Movement Desensitization Reprocessing. Well, I rearranged that, and I am also have a master's in NLP, which is called Neuro Linguistic Programming. I'm a hypnotherapist also, and I do what is known as holotropic breathing. So I included all those modalities into the EMDR format. And I get rid of trauma usually 20 to 30 minutes. And it, it, you know, I always tell people, look, don't believe a word I tell you. Sit in my chair. You can laugh at me if it didn't come, if it didn't happen. But let me warn you, it's been over 20 years. Nobody's ever laughed. <laughs> so you see, I believe in doing. I believe in you know, the outcomes. <laughs> it's not just about the talk. Anybody can sound good, OK? So what we do at the clinic is we also give nutrients. Now, are you familiar with NAD, by the way? <laughs> OK. Yep. NAD is an enzyme Okay. Okay. that we have in every cell of our body. Go look it up, guys. I can never pronounce it right, so that's why I'm not even telling you what it is. It's NICA. I can, I can never pronounce it. Anyway, look up NAD. You'll find it. Okay. And it's uh, FDA approved. And it actually helps with cellular reconstruction in your body. And it works with what is known as your mitochondria. Your mitochondria is your engine of your body, okay? That runs all the cells in your body. So we do, and it also works for depression, PTSD, and anxiety. So it's a very, very interesting substance that now is really blossoming. Mm -hmm. So we use that also in the treatment. We also do what is known as a stelia ganglia block. I just learned about this, by the way, guys. It works for PTSD and depression. And it's the ganglia in your neck, okay? And what they do is they, they use a, um, a, um, a, what do you call it? Ultrasound. And they find the ganglia and they stick a needle in there and they put uh, ketamine in there, okay, to put it to sleep, and then it reboots like a computer. And it's also used for when people have COVID, when they lose their smell and their taste, they get it back. Okay. So we do a lot of very cutting edge. We also do um, nutrient IVs, but what we do is we do micronutrient testing. So we see where you're deficient and where you have too much of, and we make the protocols to fit your individual person that you are. And we also do group therapy. So it's a whole package for people. See, most places, like see now ketamine is a, a buzzword, right? And people are just trying to make money off it. They, they give people ketamine, send them home. No. That's like, it's like going to the gym for a month, all right? And you're working out real good. And right? you say, well, I don't have to go anymore. I'm in shape. <laughs> well, that's how ridiculous it's got. So any questions you may have? Um, when was the point in your own use that you, usage that you got to a place where you're like, I will try anything and I won't give up on myself to get better? Well, here's the deal. I never thought I had a problem. They did an intervention on me. And I told you who my family was. So I was wondering who does an intervention on them. <laughs> an, inter an intervention is when people get together, uh, your family, your friends, right. therapist, and they talk to you to help you to get into treatment. Well, I didn't have a problem. They had the problem as far as I was concerned. <laughs> I love it. That's okay. so honest. So I went in, but I had like a spiritual awakening. Right. And what does that mean? Okay. 
So while I was in there, I don't know about anybody else, but when I get angry, I got rageful. Okay. Okay. And it never just went away. It took, it took, it took hours. It took even days sometimes, depending on the circumstances. That's when you do drugs. You're not in control of your brain. So what happened was it was Christmas time when I was in treatment. It was December 4th. I'm coming up on 38 years of recovery now. Fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. And so what happened was Christmas Eve, I wanted to go home. And they said, no, you can't go home. You got to stay here. So I said, well, I want my kids to, I don't want them to see me in the hospital and all this other kind of stuff. Well, I was lying. I really wanted to go home. My friends would come over, give me Christmas cards with cocaine in it, and I would go disappear. So I went running back to my room. I punched the door, you know, uh, I'm angry. And I remember my therapist saying to me, John, you ever, you ever pray on your knees? I said, look, I'm a recovering Catholic. Are you kidding me? That's all we do. I got calluses on my knees. Right. right? So he said, um, no, how about humility? I said, why? God doesn't listen to me. If I'm, How about if I'm standing in a closet? You know, it was real nasty. Because I was angry. I started to wake up. I was in treatment already two and a half, three weeks. And I was realizing of all the damage it did to myself and everyone else. Because most addicts and alcoholics, they blame everybody else for their, you know, their station in life. Sure. They never look at themselves. So what happens is that I went to get down on my knee. Now, this may sound a little strange to you, but I couldn't put my knee down. It wouldn't go down. And I had to push it down. And then I had to push my other knee down. And for the first time in my life, I pray to whatever's out there. Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Jesus, God, energy, Buddha. I don't know. Okay. All I know was whatever you want me to do, I do. Just take this away from me. Well, let me tell you a little bit. It went away like it never was there. Okay. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but I was in shock. So I turned around and tried to make it come back by thinking about all these things. Nope, couldn't come back. So that was my starting point of the change for me in recovery. I love it. I love that you bring up the fact too, that you were there to help everyone else in your family get sober, be sober, be healthy, but you didn't see your own issue for a time. And I- No, I never went to see my family be sober, be healthy. I just, they were nuts. So was I. (laughs) So I didn't even think I had, to me, it was normal to do drugs. Right. Oh, wow. Wow. Did you mention that you had helped your wife and other people first or no? Oh, no, that was later on. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. All right. Well, that's after recovery, help anybody. Who cared about anybody? I cared about myself. <laughs> I was selfish and self-centered. Right. Right. Very honest. Very true. Not about anybody else. And the victim. And the victim. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, that is so terrific. I mean, I love that you had that moment that began a different life, a different reimagining and a different future for so many people. Well, you know what is interesting is that a lot of the things I already knew and already did, uh, if you get the book, you'll see all the things that I did plays, I did television shows, had my own TV show. Uh, I threw a concert with James Brown. We had 60,000 people show up. Wow. That's how I got the Martin Luther King Award, by the way. It was really interesting. I mean, I was using at the time, but I wasn't a heavy user. I was a mostly cocaine, mm-hmm. you know, and which was heavy enough, by the way. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah. And anyway, uh, what happened was I worked for a flea market, USA. It was 500 businesses under one roof in the Black community where... Nobody would go in because it was right after the riots in 1980, 81. Sure. And um, so what I wind up doing was I said, look, we need a theme, okay, that we're going to revitalize Liberty City and teach people how to run their businesses and how to buy wholesale and how to do that. And I got the SBA people involved, the Small Business Association. And I was going to all the churches. I was dancing with the churches and getting everybody, all the community behind what I was doing. So I wanted to invite President Reagan to come to the flea market for the grand opening. Okay. So of course, everybody laughed at me. 
They said, John, the president is not coming to the flea market. I said, listen, you never know. So I got a letter back from the White House two weeks later. Everybody was in shock, right? And said, due to the president's schedule, he's sorry he can't come, but he's sending a representative. So they sent Carrie Meeks. Now, Carrie Meeks was a state representative at the time. She later became Senator Meeks. And she went around to the neighborhood and went around, you know, they really check you out before they send anybody anyway, right? And found out the kind of work I was doing in the neighborhood. I was still doing good work in the neighborhood, helping kids with karate and all this stuff. I led a double life like most addicts. And um, she went to the Martin Luther King Foundation and she presented me with the Martin Luther King Award on stage in front of 60,000 people. Wow. It was an outdoor concert I threw. And that's how we got that award. Yeah, and I got a humanitarian right. award. I got all kinds of awards. My awards got awards. But to show you, the God of my understanding, good only direction is God, G-O-D. Uh, whatever you floats your boat, I'm okay with. Uh, <laughs> I'm not here to tell anybody about religion and who they should watch and who should they look at. You know, no. Whatever works for you in your life, that's where you need to go. So that's how I look at life. I love it. I love it. Well, thank you for sharing that. And also, when people want to connect with you, find your book, learn more about the services that the clinic provides, where can where's one place where they can definitely reach out to you? Well, they can go to my website. Okay. It's on the initial J, Giordano.com. Perfect. And if they go all the way around and look at everything, you look at the entertainment part, you'll see James Brown concert. You'll see thousands of people as far as your eyes can see. Uh, you'll see all the some of the podcasts, some of the research that I'm in. Uh, and then you'll see a, a little blurb about the Ketamine Clinic of South Florida is where we do it. I work the most wonderful people. These are two women who are anesthesiologists who really, really care about people. It's not about the money. See, the money comes. When I started my company with the $300, and I was giving vitamins and meditation and we were doing all that. Everybody used to laugh at me, say, yeah, go to Giordano and give you some vitamins and it'll cure you. Today, they asked me, what vitamins am I using? <laughs> well, that's so, and uh, we were fortunate enough to become very successful. Good. Well, that's good for everyone else who's benefiting from treatment. I used to be like you and I were talking before the podcast. I was always so suspicious of anyone who talked about using, because I'm from old school probation. So when anyone talked about using psychedelics as part of treatment for, let's say, trauma or other conditions, it just sounded ridiculous. But then I went and listened to a veteran talk about what supervised legal administration of ketamine meant in his life. Right. And, you know, it made me think, well, I certainly don't know everything you know, and we got to keep our minds open. I, I, used to, I used to train a lot of probation officers. I trained police officers and things. You know, they're, unfortunately, they're not very, you're not very educated in that, that, that area. Right, exactly. And never, you're dealing with a lot of hardcore people that they lie, they manipulate. So what happens, you become jaded, you become cynical. Right. And that's what the job does. It's just, just like police officers, their personalities change. You know, when you're dealing with, with the worst of the worst all day and night, right. you look at everybody the same way after a while. Right. And and what, what happens is you, you get detached from the humanity of things, you know, because you lose in between the cracks some of the people that are really telling the truth. Right. You know, but who believes them because everybody lies. Well, I'm just glad that there are things to be hopeful about in the treatment of such things as substance abuse and trauma. I, it's very exciting. So definitely link to the work that you've done and I will list your book. And of course, if you people are watching on, on YouTube- get it on Amazon, all my books. Good, all right. And people can see the book if they watch this on YouTube. Otherwise we'll have it on show notes. And thanks so much for being here. I really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. And like I said, my dear persisters and brothers, we're, I'm not endorsing any one particular kind of treatment, but it's worth a look at some of the studies that um, our guest is talking about in treating things like deep trauma, PTSD, 
and substance abuse. And so worth a look at show notes and keeping our minds open. I am always so excited to hear there are a lot of traditional treatments that work for some people, but not for others. Talk therapy is an example, works for some people terribly for others. EMDR works great for some people, not for others. And so just having more tools in the toolbox or at least learning about them, that's pretty cool. Hope you have a fabulous week and I will see you next time. Don't forget to look back at past episodes. Now we're reaching a hundred episodes on Persistence U. And my YouTube channel, I also review movies, just my personal opinion, but love doing it. Thanks for being here. I enjoy your company as ever.